we saw, and we'll be seeking the, uh, the go ahead for that through the Committee for Procedure and Privileges uh, in the Houses of the Oireachtas uh, sometime in the near future, hopefully. And we wish, we wish Ms Ford as well and a speedy recovery. Um, so RT and the Department have been advised that the areas of focus are the appropriation of public monies by the Department to RT and the oversight of the same by the Department. Payment to RT presenters specifically from 2017 to date and how these payments were accounted for in the RT accounts. The oversight mechanisms uh, for such payment in particular, but not limited to payments to Ryan Tuberty. The process relating to the cost neutral nature of the Renault Agreement, including the persons responsible for signing off on this. Uh, the, specific, the specifics of what led to the agreement to underwrite the commercial arrangement with Renault and Ryan Tuberty, and the details of the RTE policy relating to such underwritings of these agreements. Uh, RTE's policy regarding the operation of barter accounts, why they are used, and what oversight there is uh, within RTE regarding such accounts, and the discrepancies between previous assurances given to the PSC by RTE and matters which are now in the public domain. So we are joined, we have a long list of people here today from RTE, so we are joined by Mr Adrian Lynch, Interim uh, Deputy Director, uh, Director General, Ms Geraldine O'Leary, Director of Commercial, Ms Paula Maluli, Director of Legal Affairs, Mr Rory Coveney, Director of Strategy, Mr Richard Collins, Chief Financial Officer, Ms Shuna Ralhik, Ch uh, Chairperson of the Board, Ms Anna Leary, Chair of the Audit and Risk Committee, and Robert Chart, Member of the Audit and Risk Committee, and RTE Staff Representative on the Board. Uh, we are also joined by Board Member uh, Dr PJ Matthews, who is joining us via MS Teams. And uh, I understand that Mr Matthews would have been there over the past five to six years on the Board. So we're joined, we're also joined by the following uh, individuals. Ms Maya Doherty, who is the former chairperson of the RTE board, and Mr Willie, or Mr. Willie O'Reilly, former director of commercial at RTE, who is joining us via uh, Teams online. Um, the following representatives from the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaelic, Talk, Sports and the Media are in attendance. Ms Catherine Licken, Secretary General. Ms Trina Quill, Assistant Secretary, Broadcast and the Media. Uh, Ms. Ornahalik, uh, we're ready to start, so can we have your opening statement, please? At the outset, I wish to reiterate our profound regret regarding what has emerged in recent days. We know that RTE fell far short of the standards expected of us as an organisation. We know this represents an egregious breach of trust with the public, for which we apologise. I am particularly aware today of the remit of the Public Accounts uh, Committee in ensuring accountability and transparency in how public bodies like RTE allocate, spend and manage their finances. You are charged with ensuring that the taxpayer receives value for money for every euro spent by such bodies. Given your mission of guardianship of the public purse, the failures that have come to light on RTE's part must be truly shocking to you, as they are to me. That was a particular breach of trust with you. This was a particular breach of trust with you, the elected members of the Public Accounts Committee, with a central role in Irish public life, and this is something for which we sincerely apologise. We are completely committed to rebuilding trust with you and with other public representatives. This is the least we can do. We also welcome the role that the PAC has now been afforded to examine expenditure by RTE, and we will work closely with the committee in this regard. As a trained accountant and a former financial controller, I am appalled as to how payments were recorded and presented in the RTE accounts. What was the motivation here? It appears to me that this was an act designed to deceive. The forthcoming external government review will look at matters of culture and governance, and this is welcome. But in the short term, that is not enough. Every day that passes further erodes confidence in an institution that is a cornerstone of the state. The RTE board is the governing authority of RTE, the role of the board is to guide the corporate direction and strategy of RTE and represent the interests of viewers, listeners and staff, ensuring that RTE 
fulfills its statutory responsibilities in an efficient and effective manner, we work independent of the Executive Board. As such, the Board of RTE is taking a lead in driving the following five objectives supported by outside expertise if required. Firstly, establishing the facts. From the moment the Board was informed of a potential problem, we have worked to establish the facts. Within days of receiving the first Grant Thornton report, we published the details. We have since published the first Grant, Grant Thornton report and we commit to publishing the second Grant Thornton report as soon as possible. Accountants from Grant Thornton are currently in RTE. I and the Board would also urge Dee Forbes to appear before this committee when she is able to do so. Secondly, cultural transforma transformation. Yesterday, at the Joint Earths Committee on Tourism, Culture, Arts, Sports and Media, I stated that in an organisation, culture comes from the top down. The culture of an organisation permeates its leadership and decision-making processes. RTE produces excellent journalism and creative content, but specific cultural issues around information silos, domineering hierarchies that shun transparency and foster bureaucracy are all too evident. The board will lead on addressing this. Uh, third, the internal controls. The series of events has revealed grave failings in internal controls at RTE. Nothing less than an overhaul of such controls and work practices will now suffice, and the board will oversee this process. Fourthly, examining how RTE spends its money. We need to stand back and examine how RTE manages its money. This should start with a review of the highest paid in the organisation. We will also look at those areas in which expenditure can be strengthened in pursuit of public service broadcasting, such as RTE's digital capabilities. And fifth, for future strategy. The crisis has placed RTE in a dangerous place. The board, working with the organisation, will map out a future strategy to bring this organisation to a safer haven an organisation that delivers the best in public service broadcasting, trusted by the public and employees alike. We need to strike that careful balance in achieving an organisation that can blend the ag agility needed to provide a public broadcasting service in an ever-changing market, while also having the controls and governance standards of an entity funded by the taxpayer. Finally, can I say something about the use of the word talent? Words matter, and the term, as it is currently used, reinforces a them and us culture in RTE. It implies some have greater worth than others. The first step in culture and change is to consign this term to the dustbin. I wish to restate the fact that over 1,800 people work for RTE, and I apologise to each and every one of them for the distress they are experiencing. Together, we have a job of work to do to restore their confidence. Thank you, thank you Mr. Radwick. Uh, I understand that the, that the Acting Director General uh, wishes, Adrian Lynch wishes to make a brief, very brief statement. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Lana uh, I, as Interim Director uh, General of RTE, concede that as an executive, we failed in our collective responsibility regarding the events leading to the misstatement of payments to Ryan Tuberty. I wish to state again our deep regret regarding what has emerged in recent days. For this serious breach of trust with the public, we apologise. It is a fact that the application of governance procedures at an executive board level allowed for the partial and incomplete sharing of information so that individual members of the executive either did not have access to information or had information withheld from them. It is true that the Executive Board failed in its collective responsibility to act as a collective and failed to ensure good governance in this matter. Collectively, owing to the siloed style of the procedures at the Executive and an over-reliance on the prerogative asserted by the Director-General, we did not receive a comprehensive evaluation of Ryan Tuberty's contract in full, including the way in which the payments were to be treated. We acknowledge and accept this failure by those members specifically of the executive 
who were aware of the contract. I've spoken to Kevin Backhurst last night, and I understand from Kevin that his first task uh, when he begins on July the 10th will be a complete reconstitution of the executive board of RTE. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lynch. Uh, Ms. Aiken from the Department, Secretary General. Your statement, please. Thank you for the invitation to be here at today's meeting of the committee. I'm glad to have the opportunity to make this opening statement to the members. Public service broadcasting, as has been reiterated on numerous occasions in the last week, plays a critical role in informing, educating and entertaining the public. Critically also, it holds to account those in positions of responsibility and power. It is also frequently at the forefront in tackling misinformation. That is why, as the Minister and her colleagues in government have repeatedly emphasised over the past week, there is a need for RTE to show appropriate leadership and give a full account of all of the circumstances that led to the making of these payments and the understatement of earnings. The Department is working intensively to support Minister Martin in ensuring that the governance structures and culture that enabled this issue to arise are comprehensively addressed. In that regard, the Department and the Minister is engaging with RTE on the steps it is taking to deal with the matter in order to provide full clarification on all aspects of these transactions, including the timely completion of the Grant Thornton Review into the payments between 2017 and 2019. The Department is also working intensively with the Minister on the development of the terms of reference for the external in review into governance and culture at RTE, which the Minister announced in recent days. This review will focus on whether RTE's governance framework is fit for purpose and whether it is in line with best government governance practice in commercial state bodies, taking account of broadcasting legislation, the code of practice for the governance of state body requirements, and the findings from the various Grant Thornton reviews commissioned by RTE. The review will also consider RTE's organisational culture and the impact that that culture has had on levels of trust, governance, transparency and communications, and on what changes should be made. As part of this process, the Department is supporting, supporting the Minister in her engagement with key stakeholders, including representatives from the National Union of Journalists and Screen Producers Ireland, whom we met yesterday. The, detailed of the, the details of the terms of reference are currently being finalised and, when approved by governments, will be published. Public service broadcasting, as I have said, is critical to the proper functioning of our society. RTE plays a central role in that regard. It is in all our interests that the issues at RT are addressed in a comprehensive and effective manner. As Minister Martin has stated, the organisation has been badly damaged by the revelations over the past week, and it is vital that public confidence in RT is restored. Thank you again for the time to, given to make this statement, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank there. you, Ms Lakin. Um, and I'm going to go to the committee members now, and the first committee member today is Deputy James O'Connor, 15 minutes and 10 for everyone else. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I think from the outset, I think uh, it has to be stated that all of us um, stand in solidarity with the ordinary workers of RTE uh, and I suppose how disappointed and let down all of them are. I know it has been acknowledged here, but ultimately it's about responsibility now and accountability and that's what we need to get to the bottom of today. And I think there are a number of things even in the opening statement there today by the Chairperson that you know contradict what has gone on within your organisation over the course of the last number of years. Uh, and why you alone are, are not, we're not alone in that. I know we are joined by the fire former chairperson today. I think that's an inescapable fact. Um, we do need to speak to the former director general when uh, she is in a, a state to speak to us. We acknowledge that, wish her well and to recover. But it is imperative that that would happen as well. And I do feel by what happened in yesterday's committee appearance uh, that significant blame was laid at that particular door. And we are unable at this time to get answers to those questions, but we will when that opportunity arises. And in terms of the public rebuilding confidence, the first question I have soon is in relation to the pay of the executive board of RTE. Is that something that you're going, now going to look upon? And can you furnish this committee with the earnings of each member of that in time, of next, in time for next week's meeting? 
As I said, one of the first things that we're looking at is the uh, the uh, the salaries of and the payments to the top earners uh, in RTE, and that would include the executive board. In terms of um, publishing those, it's certainly something that we are considering should be done, and it was discussed yesterday at the Joint Directors Committee as well in relation to that. To consider is not enough. I think they yeah. need to be published in full. Yeah, I because nothing else, quite frankly, is going to rebuild the public's trust with your organisation until they know precisely how much money each member has earned. And I think in addition to that, the top 100 earners within the organisation of RT should also now be made public. I think that's absolutely imperative. Yeah, and I, and I, I undertake to do that. You intend to do it. Yeah. Do you have a timeline on such a decision being, ta or be being implemented well, or when the public will be made aware of this and this committee? And as soon as practically possible in terms of being able to draw the, extract the information and make it, make it available. Okay, so we committee. welcome that decision. Yeah. Why we arrived at this position was in relation to Mr. Tuberty's €350,000 um, additional uh, non-declared uh, payment between 2017 and 2022. <laughs> uh, and we need to get to the bottom of how these arrangements uh, effectively are negotiated, who are the participants in those uh, negotiations. So I understand that these decisions were taken by the Director General, but were there other members of the Executive Committee that would have participated in such negotiations that are present here? That's correct. And elements. Would you identify them, please? Uh, in terms of who was, so they uh, they wouldn't have necessarily all the information, but Adrian would have uh, Adrian yeah. Lynch would have had some of the information. Um, there are people who aren't here who would have ha had the information. So the director of content would have had some of the information. The finance, uh, financial Richard would have had some of the information. And uh, Geraldine Can you not see from a governance perspective, even in reply to the question, it's quite a simple question that I'm asking, just how much of a mess has been created? I, I agree. That's why, th that's why I'm here. That's why we're here. It's because it is that mess. So in terms of the Renault deal, that was first, it, came, it first came into being in, in 1998, is that correct? Uh, I'd have to refer to Geraldine O'Leary on that one. No, the, uh, Renault had an ongoing sponsorship arrangement with RTE Commercial. The first um, uh, connection with RTE and any talent contract or any commercial client with a talent contract was in at the end of February 2020, when I was advised by the then CFO that the contract negotiations with Ryan Tobity were finishing, um, for the, were being put in place for the following four to five years. It changed, but it was four at the time, and that there was going to be a commercial element, the commercial, and that they would talk to me about it. I subsequently was advised by the Director General that the idea that they, uh, at this stage, I was not brought in when the contract was being done. Um, I was advised that the idea behind the commercial deal was that. We, I would talk to the sponsor about including some personal appearances from Ryan Tuberty as part of the overall Renault, uh, Renault relationship with RTE. Was Mr Tuberty the only presenter within RTE that was receiving money as a consequence of Renault's deals with RTE? Uh, yes. The only person? Yes. And no previous presenters involved in any RTE shows Just to repeat, were benefactors of that? I have never ever been across, I'm in RTE since 1997, and I have never before been across any element of a talent contract. So let's proceed to the decision by, by that deal to come to a conclusion where RT subsequently stepped forward to supplement Mr. Tuberty's salary in a very confidential arrangement, I think is probably the most politically correct term we could use here. Do you believe that was appropriate? Well, the, um, the, uh, the, the Renault deal, and just to correct it, uh, I spoke to Renault about year one only. There is some suggestion that Renault didn't renew. Uh, we only spoke to Renault about year one. In year two, there was... And just for the public's knowledge, the amount of money in year one? The amount of money in year one was €75,000 um, paid for three appearances by Ryan Tuberty, which subsequently happened in 2022 because of COVID. Mm -hmm. May I ask you the same question I asked you originally? Mm -hmm. Do you think what happened following on from that, where RT stepped in, in a confidential arrangement, in figures that were not made public, do you think that was appropriate? I was not aware that the figures were not going to be made it's public. Not, it's not, I'm not asking you whether or not you were aware, Ms O'Leary, to be fair, I'm not. 
But I am asking you, do you think that was an appropriate arrangement? In hindsight, no. Excellent. It's good to know that. But from the point of view of who was aware, back to, to soon, who was aware? You said that there were people in this room that would have had some knowledge of what went on. Yes, and that's what I have said. There was a I Adrian, yeah? Yeah, I, I can answer that. So typically, in terms of uh, talent contracts, how they're negotiated is they're led by the CFO, input from legal, then regarding the hours and services provided, I would input into that. Uh, and then in terms of talent choices, the director of content would input into that. In terms of Ryan Tuberty's deal and who was aware of it, in terms of the terms of the deal and how much you'd be paid, that would have been myself, uh, director of content, the CFO, um, legal <coughs> and the Director General would be the people who would be aware. So, Do you feel that you've misled the public in a very underhand way? It has had massive reper rep repercussions from the point of view of people's reputations, the organisations, the individuals involved, the fact that your Director General is now gone. What, yeah. do you think, what do you think of what has been achieved here? Yeah, so in terms of that, I would say the information I was provided with was that there was going to be a sponsorship arrangement whereby Ryan Tuberty would be paid if it was enacted, uh, and then there was his standard contract. Things progressed on, and then, obviously, there was a further commercial undertaking given that if the sponsorship contract wasn't enacted, that RTE would underwrite the contract. Um, so if you remember, that was in a period of COVID. It was very difficult to actually enact the sponsorships. So and while half of the yeah. country's positions and employment yeah. were potentially impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, we don't, I don't need to lecture anybody here about how difficult that was for everybody, no matter what role in society they occupied in Ireland. And from an employment perspective, RTE saw fit to contrive some type of a scheme in order to maintain the pay privately in unpublished figures for one of the biggest earners in the organisation already in the middle of a pandemic. So at the point at which uh, RTE paid Ryan Tuberty, they should have been declared at that point in time. Which is all well and good to say that now, but why didn't you do it originally? So what occurred in this instance is the sponsorship agreement was three events which would happen publicly, so there's nothing... And obviously they couldn't, they couldn't proceed on account of COVID-19, correct? Correct. So at that so point he in time... Came in, with the public purse and filled in the gap. That's Correct. what happened. That's appalling. It's absolutely appalling. I totally agree. I had no knowledge that RTE had directly paid Ryan Tuberty. Who had? So uh, I have looked at the kind of correspondence and spoken to each individual exec board member uh, over the last seven days since this blew up. So from what I can see, there was a commercial decision made on May the 7th, 2020, between the Director General and NK Management that this contract would be underwritten. That is the only evidence I can see of a commitment uh, that was given then. So and from that the organisation of RTE, yes. the employees of RTE, yeah. I'm going to ask you the question again, who was aware? So from everything I have seen, the Director General was aware because she had given this undertaking to NK management that if the sponsorship deal did not happen, RTE would pay the bill. Mr. Coveney, do you sit in in meetings with the Director General when there's negotiations in relation to the pay of RTE's top stars? Uh, no, I don't. I have no role to play at all in, in the negotiation of top talent contracts. Never did. Um, and I've just been that part of my role. From, in terms of the commercial activity uh, relating to RTE, uh, for example, you, you would have had a significant lead in a number of projects undertaken by the organisation. Is that not correct? That's true. Okay. Just in relation to questions that were put yesterday by the chairperson of the Committee, committee on Media, uh, Neve Smith TD, uh, just in relation to uh, the figures around the profitability of a commercial undertaking by RTE uh, to do the Late Late Toy Show programme uh, and, and actually have it uh, as, 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 a, as a musical, sure, yeah. um, can you give us the figures in relation to how profitable that undertaking was? Uh, look, we've already shared uh, substantial information with the committee about the, the, the provenance of the project, the rationale I, I of the project. I watched yesterday's proceedings. No, you didn't. 
No, we did with this committee. We, we, we've, we've made a substantial submission to this, to this committee about the project, about the rationale for the gestation, the research that went into it. And what was the outcome of it? Um, well, not great, to be, to be honest. Um, I mean, but I Are you in a position to inform us what the losses were? And not at the moment. Um, we, and when will you be able to do so? Look, we, we, we enter into a whole series of commercial, <coughs> commercial relationships in relation to this, this project, which are sensitive, with third parties involved. And uh, look, we're happy to look again and to see what we can share and come back to the quid. My understanding was an unmitigated disaster. Is that accurate? It wasn't successful, um, but it was, it was always envisaged to being a multi-annual project. We have decided not to proceed with it this year. We're looking at other options for it into the future. Oh. And we don't want to compromise our capacity to negotiate with third parties in relation to um, those arrangements in the future. So, can, can I ask the chairperson, when it comes to <coughs> accountability with money that's squandered within RT, do you accept, you know, on foot of the information that's come to light, that the structures of payment within the organisation are nowhere near fit for purpose? You look at the number of agency staff that have been employed, you look at the key stars, the highest earners, that the power that Mr. Kelly had over RT as an organisation. You know, what stopped RT from saying to the individuals involved that, you know, this is probably not tenable to continue with, and we want to now mm. fill our prime slots with full-time ro roles that are, people are hired within RT's structure itself, rather than allowing these agents to have such bartering power? I don't disagree with you there. I think that's, I, I know that's the way we have to go. Was this a conversation that the board of RT never had? Like how, how, how do we get to this position where ultimately a PR catastrophe is the cause of us now having this conversation? Did the, did the executive board of RT not recognise surely before now that one individual had pretty much godlike power when it came to the, the presenters that are being allowed airtime on our most significant broadcaster in the state? Correct. And, and, and that's what we're looking at in terms of whether we continue to deal with agents. What are you going to do going forward from here? That's what I'm talking about. We're the five pillars that I sort of called out there in terms of reviewing of the uh, internal controls, um, the establishing the facts as what, what, which we have done and the role of the Audit and Risk Committee in that, cultural transformation, internal controls, examining how the money is spent and under that one would be looking at items such as you have raised here today. I must ask in relation to the Grant Thornton report mm. currently being prepared by R the RT Board for Audit, the Audit and Risk Committee, but I just want to ask, this is an ongoing mess and there's more information coming to light with each day that goes by. Have you the scope to allow the extension of that report to include information that may come to light in the coming weeks? Just to clarify, you're talking about the report that's currently underway? Yes, the second report. Yeah, so I, I'll let Anne take this, but just to point out... It's, it's fine. Yeah. This, uh, just yeah. Time is limited, sorry. OK, it, just so th that you're all aware, you've got to remember that this all was initiated by the fact that the auditor, Deloitte, came to me, said there was a problem. We had a look at the problem. He came back and he said he wasn't happy and he advised me to get forensic accountants in. As a result, we immediately went to Grant Thornton and started this process and then gave the report. So this is an example of the board and the Audit and Risk Committee actually doing their job. So... We have now extended it in terms of terms of reference, and when they finish this one, we have another um, job of work for them to do. So the answer to that is yes, we will be extending the terms of reference of the uh, Grant Thornton team. In conclusion, I think on foot very of briefly, it, yeah, yeah, very briefly, yeah. it, it is a conclusion. I think on foot of what the Taoiseach has said this afternoon, the chairperson of the media committee yesterday, Neil Smith said, I think it's important that now, given all of this information and the lack of information you're able to provide and the answers to the questions that Ryan Toberty would be invited to appear before this committee and also uh, also uh, Mr Kelly. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Deputy Munster. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, first question is for uh, Mr Collins. Um, you were asked yesterday if you were aware of the problem with the invoices um, and you said no and about an hour later into the meeting the committee um, got the truth from you that you were actually uh, aware of the issue in early March and you had said that you weren't, you previously said that you weren't aware of it before the 17th of March. Um, you said that Deloitte had spoken to you and they'd flagged up concerns and that um, they were seeking an explanation 
and that you spoke to the Director General uh, following that, and then you were to get back to Deloitte. Okay, can you tell us what that conversation was with the Director General and what, what she actually told you about the invoices? What explanation hey, yeah, did sure. she give? Okay, so look, on the 7th of March, Deloitte's approached me, uh, which would be normal at the end of an audit. I wouldn't be involved in the detail of the audit, but at the end of the audit, if there were issues outstanding, um, they, they would approach me. So uh, they raised the issue of these invoices there, and they asked me what they were for. Um, I undertook then to speak to the Director General about them. I asked the Director General what they were for. Uh, she told me they were uh, consultancy invoices relating to Noel Kelly management and I relayed that back to Deloitte. Right, so when she said there were consultancy invoices relating to... Consultancy Noel invoices relating to services provided during COVID. Services, sorry, services. Noel Kelly. That Noel Kelly had provided services. Right. And you asked what were those services? Uh, I did. Uh, and what did she level. say? The services were in relation to how we restructured during... Um, what? How we restructured... How RTE restructured its operations. Noel to, Kelly? Yes, to help with... Uh, was given RTE in advice? In, yes, he was. In what capacity? Yeah. He was giving advice to RTE in, in, um, in terms of how we dealt with sponsors, how, to be honest, I got a high level. Bit, you're a bit yeah. Okay. Look, bit vague. I, yeah. To be honest, I got a high level uh, response from the director general. Deloitte's weren't happy with the response right. I was no, given. I, I can't. To I, I won't go there. Explain I, that because yeah. Noel Kelly was advising RTE. He was advising. He was providing. Deal he, with yeah. agents during COVID. Yeah, during COVID. And he, he was, was getting seventy-five thousand yes. of a fee for that. So, what advice did he give? I don't know exactly oh, what right. advice you, he so gave. So you didn't ask... No, right. I did oh, ask... Hold, hold on, sorry. No, yeah, sorry, if you not, let me just finish yourself. there. It's yeah. myself that yeah, is confused. Yeah, yeah, no, if you just let me... No, I, no it's myself that's confused. Yeah. So you have... You're the chief finance officer. There's €75,000, um, or two payments of 75000 Deloitte flagged it up with you that there was concerns about it. You spoke to the Director General. She said, oh, it's in relation to Noel Kelly given advice about agents during COVID, and we'll hear about the detail of what exactly that entailed. And you thought, okay, that's worth 150,000. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't think that so was what, worth 150,000 at what, the time. What did you learn from that 150's worth that you thought? I can't remember exactly what, oh, what, what how she It must have wasn't value for money it. then if you can't remember it. Well, I can't, I can't remember. I'm not going to speculate on what that was. I can come back to you. I probably have notes. And how did you relay was. that to I relayed Deloitte? It, I relayed it back to Deloitte. And the Is there an email or...? No, verbal. Verbal, right. And the response that I gave to Deloitte, they weren't happy with. I so they would followed say so. Up. <laughs> Sorry. I would imagine so, yeah. Um, so that was... So you are saying at that stage, at the beginning of March, you knew nothing about that these were top-up payments. You knew Noel Kelly was involved some way, but you didn't question it enough. You took the, the story that the Director General told you that there were consultancy fees to Noel Kelly because he was given RTE advice on how to manage agents during COVID. Am I yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, not agents, not agents. What was, was it then? It wasn't agents. I can't remember exactly what... Oh, come what on, 150,000 you gave the nod for. And you I can't didn't give remember. the nod. No, sorry, let me clarify that. I never gave the nod but for this. you didn't this. ask finance questions not... as finance officer. You didn't ask questions about value for money, oversight. What's this hundred... If, there weren't, if it wasn't about agents, what was it about? It was to do with how RT was structured during COVID. Right, just give one sentence about what that entails. That the executive it, it, board didn't have the knowledge of or didn't no. have the expertise about... Just it was advice that the Director General had received on how RT structured itself and presented itself during COVID. Now, I can't say any more than that because I, I'd have to consult my notes and see exactly what explanation was given. But I relayed back exactly what I was told to Deloitte's. And then, and at that stage, I wasn't involved in improving 
the transaction at that stage, the transaction had happened. I was yes. relaying back an explanation. But the auditors the had flagged up a concern about the payments. It flagged up a concern. You raised on... it with the Director General. You didn't question her pretty much. You took it on board. Well, I took her explanation. She said, yeah, yeah, you didn't. As Chief Financial Officer, you thought, that's grand. I'll get back. I'll tell Deloitte. That's what the story was. And then it went from there. So that, that's what you're saying. That's what it was, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Would you say that's you're not effectively doing your job? Well, I think at that stage she gave what appeared to be a plausible explanation. You can't remember. Say, Look, I we'll can't move remember on the exact details. That's, of yeah, it. it's just yeah. so ridiculous. I'm yeah. going to move on. Um, just in relation to uh, the commercial director Geraldine O'Leary, there, you told me yesterday that you couldn't remember the consultancy fees, the exact, the precise detail on the heading of the invoices that you raised. Um, you couldn't remember whether it was consultancy fees or what. Um, so I'm just wondering, I'd imagine you're extremely diligent. Did you check between now and then? You couldn't remember no, the exact uh, detail. Uh, Deputy, I didn't say that I didn't remember the term consultancy fees. What I said was I didn't remember who had advised to put the term consultancy fees on the invoice, right. which is very different. But you checked that out. But I know, I knew yesterday, the term consultancy fees is on the invoices, which were also given to me once the issue arose. So who advised? So what I said yesterday and what I repeat today is I had a number of conversations with both the Director General and Noel Kelly about the raising of these invoices. And in, I cannot remember whether it was Noel Kelly who suggested it or whether it was the Director General. And rather than make an incorrect statement, I have consistently said that I, I don't remember because it is the truth. OK, but you didn't check between yesterday and today. You knew you were coming in here today to have the answer for us, whether check it was Noel what? Kelly or the director. Surely, have you, have no. you notes? You had a meeting with um, the agent there, uh, with Ryan Turberty's agent. You had a conference call with him. Um, March 22, or prior to that, where the raising of the invoices um, was suggested, or was, was discussed. Mm -hmm. And are you suggesting that at that stage she didn't say why they wanted to raise these invoices, that it was a guarantee? No, I didn't understand it. There's a couple of things here, and the terminology, and I just want to repeat this again, it was either Noel Kelly or the Director General, but I'm not sure which one. Right. So in the absence of being 100% uh, certain, I believe it is correct to say that I don't remember because I don't. It was but you didn't seek to find that information between yesterday and today. I've been trying to find that information, Deputy, since March of this year. I have been right. through the whole Grant Thornton forensic accountant. There's no... I have been 100% honest all the way through. Mm. And I told Grant Thornton that I would not make a statement that I could not 100% be certain okay. of, and that remains to But be you had that meeting with Noel Kelly. I had no, a number of Conference number call. Of conference, call yes. conference call you yes. had, yes. Yeah, yes. It was, you know what I said when you said... You had yes, a conference call. Yes, that I conference call is a meeting. In, in a, yes. But you had that. So you reckon it was either himself or, or um, the Director General that advised you to put consultancy fees down. But you didn't, you didn't question that. You didn't say, but they're not consultancy fees. Because during that conversation with Noel Kelly, he would have said to you what the invoices were for. Yes. yes. And what did he say they were for? No, it, it was more, I was taking my instruction from the Director General who said... No, but what did Noel Kelly, when the conversation you had with him, uh, he was looking to have those invoices raised, what did he tell you the invoices were for? Um, now, come on, be truthful. I, I, I what did he tell I, you I the invoices were for? But just to be clear, Deputy, I, uh, I spoke to him about raising the invoices to send to the barter company. Right. And in so that you were having a conversation with Noel Kelly about raising invoices, but yes. you didn't know what the invoices oh, were I for. I knew the invoices. Seriously. I, Deputy, I knew the invoices were related to the 75 grand payment per year, which I had been across <coughs> in year one, yeah, and so which I was not across in year two and three, but was asked to use the barter account to pay for it. So yeah. I, I knew what they were for. You knew they were for yes. top-up payments for Ryan Tuberty, yes, yeah. Yes, I did. But you still went ahead with them. Yes, you didn't did. question anything. You knew that they were being put through the, you were raising the invoices, putting them through accounts under the heading of consultancy fees, knowing full well that they were top-up payments for Ryan Tuberty. I had no idea whether there was a separate agreement. I knew in did year... You? No, I knew in year one that Ryan Tuberty did a legitimate... There was a legitimate deal with Renault where three events happened, and they did happen in 2022. 
I knew there was nothing done through a commercial partner for these invoices, but I did not know what other things Ryan Tuberty might be doing for RT for that payment. That was not discussed with me. Could I just have one very short just question? Very it's just to um, the Paula Malouli, just the legal services. Um, would you have a view on any legal concerns raised by kind of creating Should false invoices, if you like? Yes. Could there be, yeah. Is it something that could be kind of um, pre presented as a criminal offence? No, and we took specific advice on or that. Or could there be company law or tax, <coughs> tax law breaches? And, and I'm not familiar with the specifics of that, but I would agree it's highly inappropriate. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Okay. So, could you just ask, ask Mr. Collins, just to clarify, you were aware, you were aware that the seventy-five thousand was for NK Noel Kelly. Okay, that, that was going for consultancy. Yeah, but and and you said that it was in relation to services for consultancy. In a vague way, you said about how how RT dealt with agents. No, and how RT structured well, itself. Well, Mr. No, no, you said about yeah. relating to agents. Yeah, no, I, well, well, Mr. Yeah. Kelly is an agent. Yeah, no, sorry, I, I, if, so I, I, if I said Mr. agents, I just correct that. So yeah. Just so us, we're clear before we move on here. Yeah. Have we a situation in RT where Noel Kelly was getting uh, seventy-five thousand payments, okay. supposed to be under the heading of consultancy as an agent to help RT to understand how they should deal with agents? Because that's the picture that's being presented. No, it wasn't. It wasn't explained that he was. This was to help it. No, but you allowed to check. Sorry, you were allowed to check. You allowed. You allowed the credit. No, I didn't. I, no, I didn't allow the credit. I didn't approve it, and I didn't write any check. That was, the explanation given to me was that this was a payment. I had no. I didn't know who CMS management were before this was queried by uh, Deloitte. And I was told the explanation that was given by the Director General was that this was consultancy services that Noel Kelly had provided. But during at that point, when you heard the name Noel Kelly, did you not, when you heard Noel Kelly and consultancy services at RTE, did alarm bells not ring in your head as the Chief Financial Officer? Because I failed to understand yeah. why. Yes or no? Did alarm? Did you not question that one? Well, I was, one bit? I, I was concerned, but I knew the Director General concerned. had a close relationship with, director, with Noel Kelly. So it's okay because of that? Well, it wasn't OK. okay. The, the, the transaction had occurred at this stage. I was answering, I was providing an explanation as part of the audit to Deloitte. Your explanation here is ridiculous. Yeah. I'm telling you that. Mark, Deputy Okotsik. Yeah, good morning. here, like, um, look, it's, it's an appalling vista we're facing, and it, we have to acknowledge there's been huge damage done to public trust and a public broadcaster at a time when... <clears throat> High quality public broadcasting has arguably never been more important for countering the, the misinformation and disinformation that social media in particular tends to be awash with. That there's huge damage done uh, to the working relationships of people within RTE um, and to the morale of the many very excellent people who are working within that organisation. I think that's all been acknowledged already. Um, Ms O'Leary, I want to return just briefly to you. Uh, and better detail that you gave us. You said you only spoke to Renault about year one engagements. No hint at all of arrangements into year two. How many years was it the original contract for? Was um, it a five-year contract or a three-year? The, the Ryan W contract? Yeah. Yeah, well, my concern is it was a sponsorship contract and we were in year, coming to the end of year two of a three-year contract. So um, uh, this was in March 2020. We still had two months of that season to go and then... The, there was a third, third year in the contract, so the contract was due to end in May 2021. Well, you only spoke about year one arrangements? Because that was the only... Yes, yes. I did talk to the client about a potential extension of the contract beyond 2021, but obviously that wasn't pragmatic because uh, he so still had 14, 15 months to run in his contract. My question then, and it may not be to you, and were Renault aware of the underwriting agreement. So were no. Renault aware that if they removed themselves for this contract, that RTE were left on the hook for the remainder of the payments? Not only were Renault not aware of it, neither was I. Is there anybody who, who would demur from that position who would suggest that Renault were aware of the underwriting? No. Are there, were there any exit penalties from Renault who were asked to enter into this contract be fairly standard practice and procedure, I'm sure, that if somebody exited from a contract before end of time, that there would be exit penalties attached to it. Sorry, I'm a bit confused. 
Or, so the, they entered into a contract over a number of, of years. They, a broadcast they, sponsorship contract for the Late Late Show is what I'm referring to, which is what my business is. So they were in year two of a three-year three broadcast sponsorship contract of the Late Late And decided Late. to end, end a relationship? No, they didn't. They, no, they didn't. So it was in the middle, it was coming to the end of year two, season two, of a three-year broadcast sponsorship contract, which is standard practice in our business, that I was asked to ask them if they would like to have an addendum to their contract, which involved uh, appearances by Ryan Tuberty. The broadcast sponsorship contract was running, was up and running, and they ran, they ran it through. In fact, they, re they renewed for following year. So the broadcast sponsorship contract was up and running. It was within the context of this contract I asked them if they wanted to, if they would, um, were interested in three appearances by Ryan Tuberty because it was connected to their sponsorship of the Late Late, which he presented. Okay. The broadcast sponsorship ran its course and was renewed. Okay, but without the additional. Now, it just doesn't seem that there was a great deal of protection for, I suppose, public funding on it. I want to take a look at this idea of, um, well, the suspension first of Ms D Forbes and then this request, in fact, the request for resignation happened first and we only found this out yesterday, happened on Friday the 16th, if I'm correct. Um, Ms Anne O'Leary, am I correct in saying that, that the recommendation for that, that Ms Forbes be asked to resign, that came from the Audit and Risk Committee? That's, that's correct. Um, uh, as a result of the um, Van Thornton report, I thought that um, what had occurred was significantly um, serious enough for um, to ask her for her resignation. And then I think uh, subsequent to that, she decided not to to um, reply to our letter on that. So we then put her on suspension following a HR disciplinary approach. Was recommendation to suspend also? Yeah. A recommendation that you brought? It was a recommendation that the committee and, and I brought to the board and then the board approved that recommendation. Okay, so it then became a board decision both to ask for the resignation but also to initiate the suspension. Would that be correct? That's correct. And then directly after that, the board um, created a, um, a smaller committee who were going to handle the HR disciplinary issue. Can I ask for... That as company secretary, just to set out the timeline, there was an audit and risk meeting on the Friday. There was a number of recommendations out of that, including the uh, request to ask the director general to resign. I think the chair spoke to her in relation to that. There was a response by letter either on the Sunday or the Monday, I can't recall. There was a board meeting on the Monday where the chair of the audit and risk committee brought the recommendations to the board of the audit and risk committee. The board agreed to set up a disciplinary subcommittee to look at the disciplinary matters surrounding the director general. Okay. Well, this is this is, I mean, this is a decision with very significant implications. So I want to ask, uh, as a board member, when this was brought to the board, what was the rationale given for initiating these proceedings? So the board must have been told we are recommending that we ask for a resignation, and we are asking for that on these grounds? What were the grounds given? The grounds were given uh, the, uh, the Grant Thornton report that you all have a copy of. Okay. I thought it was significantly serious. And that, but that was it. It was as boldly stated as that based on the findings of Grant Thornton. Very good. Thank you very much. I want to ask uh, regarding the barter account, um, which much, much discussion has um, gone about. Value of transactions in and out uh, is given to us in some of the... Um, some of the details that we have here. How many trading partners are represented within that, within that barter account? How many clients? Yes. Um, well, in uh, 2022, it was 56 campaigns, so um, probably about maybe 15 clients, 10 to 15 clients. Would there be any credit or debit cards attached to the, the barter account? Not that I'm aware of. Not that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. It's something I'd need to check, but not that um, I'm aware of. Uh, I wanted to ask then, in terms of the type of expenditure that... that Sorry, happened. can I ask you to ask me that question again? In rela when you say a credit or a debit card... Well, it's just the, how, it, how it operates, whether there's credit cards, whether this is... Look, it's about transparency and, and mm -hmm. having a good insight on 
how exactly this is being used? I mean, is it also being used to fund things like travel? Is it being used to fund things like entertainment? Yes. What's the mechanism that, and what's the oversight mechanism in terms of making sure if it's funding travel, for example, or accommodation or entertainment, that those have a legitimate business purpose within the organisation? Yes. There, there was no creditor or debit cards attached to it. Payments were made out of the barter camp by giving an instruction to the barter company. But I want, I, I, I'm, I want to be 100% clear that the barter company may use a credit card when they're paying for something. I can't say that if that's what you're asking me. Uh, there's no credit card at our end, but um, the barter company may have a, cre may um, use a credit card. Just in terms of bare figures, so the, the, there's 150,000 euro is what ends up being paid to Total Productions Limited, mm -hmm. which is the two tranches of 75,000 euros. But the, the transfer from the barter account, correct me if I'm wrong, is 231,000. Correct. Where's the 81,000? So the way the barter account works is that when, when the campaigns come through, 50% is cash and 50% is credits. Um, those credits are accumulated and reconciled monthly. We can use those credits for uh, travel or uh, anything we've used them for as being client related um, up to now. Um, and then if at the end of the year, if there's money in the account, we cash it out and the cash out rate is 0.65. So if there's 100 grand left in the, end, in the account at the end of the year, it's cashed out at 65 grand and that is put into our revenue. So the cash out rate for the barter companies is 0.65. Okay, this is all very opaque, but in the, in the, end, of, in the end of the story here, has 150,000 in fact cost us 231,000? It has cost us a hundred and uh, it has cost us one hundred and fifty thousand in cash. Okay, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I fully accept that answer. Um, I just want to pick up on a statement. Just Mr. Lynch, you say in the, the very end of your um, opening statement there. I've spoken to Mr. Backhurst last night. I understand his first task will be a complete reconstruction of the executive board of RTE, that's a very significant statement. I want to give you an opportunity to expand on it. Yeah, thanks very much. I've been talking to Kevin, obviously, over the last two weeks since I stepped up to be the interim deputy DG. And um, so uh, we spoke this morning, particularly around coming out of yesterday, the register of interests. So we're now looking at immediately drawing up terms of reference to register of interest for all senior editorial staff. Um, but then in terms of uh, the, the line here, really it is up to the incoming DG to make all the necessary changes given what has happened. On that issue of register of interest, yes. will a re register of interest be extended to presenters? Absolutely. Okay. Now thank we, you. That thank, you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair, for coming here today and all of the officials who are here. Can I open with the uh, Grant Thornton report? Uh, paragraph uh, 22G, and it says, the Director General was not involved in the drafting, signing, or implementation of this agreement, being the tripartite agreement. Can I ask, actually ask, it would be set out and right for me, and I ask you to give me the list of everyone who was involved in the drafting of that agreement and involved in that agreement, because, you know, I think it's important that this, because the statement from earlier on said that no member of the RT executive board other than the director general had all the necessary information. Yet, this is what Grant Thornton is saying. Can you reconcile? Yeah. Just, just, sorry, go ahead. If I could possibly clarify that, the tripartite agreement that is referred to in the Grant Thornton report is the commercial agreement that we did in year one between Renault, RT and NK management in relation to the three events. Can we have the names of all the people involved in that? Yes. Okay, can we, you might send that on to us in Certainly. writing, okay? I was one. And I move on to the issue in relation to um, the 75,000, and I know, and I want to go to you, Mr. Collins, and about the invoice. If you have someone who's acting as a consultant, aren't they obliged to charge VAT on the fees they charge? It depends where the, the invoice is uh, No, no, but the standard today. invoice would yeah. have a VAT component. Am I correct? Standard, standard invoice would have a VAT. Yeah, component. and when you got the invoice into your accounts department, how come that issue wasn't, uh, for the clarification, wasn't looked for in that? Because the invoice was being invoiced to a UK company. 
not an Irish company. And what's the scenario in relation to a, a VAT in that, in that there's scenario? No, there's no VAT charged. But were you aware of the, in the, the detail of the invoice because it was consultancy fees? Surely it would set out in any invoice. And I've been involved in business for 30 years. You're a qualified financial advisor here. Um, surely just consultancy fees is not sufficient description on an invoice. Would you accept? I'd say it, it, it's, it's, a, it's quite a, a sparse description on a, an invoice. But isn't it not that. a duty on your part then to raise a query as regards what that, those consultancy fees were for? I think, yes, in hindsight it is. But at the time... But OK, this, let's this, go on. This invoice, how many more invoices yeah. like this okay. came through where there were consultancy fees there was marked two, down? There was two consultancy fees. But have invoices. we looked at other accounts? Have we looked at other accounts about where the description consultancy fees and it went through the system without anyone asking, raising questions? We haven't done a detailed analysis. Well, isn't it time to do a detailed analysis? I, I think it is, and that was discussed yesterday, and I believe the ARC are going to look at that. And every other business in this country, invoices... They're uh, robustly checked by any organisation, and especially a large organisation does more, um, more of an onus because it's a public service broadcaster to cross-check everything that comes in. Yeah, I think if I can just explain what happened here. The barter account sat outside the normal system of control. Yeah, it's a slush fund, because yeah. if you look at the dif definition of a slush fund, and I got it from Black's Law Dictionary, a reserve of money held secretly by a company that had no accountability for its use. That's exactly what we're talking about. This is a slush fund. So let's talk, talk about it being a barter account. Okay. We had very little accountability about the money going into it. There was. But like, had it sat within the internal control system, you know, for expenditure of 75,000, it would have probably been... But you're in charge of the internal control system. Procured. I mean, you, you know, this is money going from RTE to a barter account where you don't even know what the money is for. Am I correct? I, the, the invoice was labelled consultancy services. It was approved by the director. But you're the financial director. You have the opportunity of raising queries. I'm asking you, OK, you didn't raise a query on, any, on this. Have you raised queries on other invoices coming in over the last two to three years? I haven't seen other invoices coming in with... Uh, consultancy services, just labelled consultancy but services. But isn't that more so reason for then asking the question if you haven't? Yeah, it is the reason now why we should go back and look at this. And, you know, when you, when you um, became aware of the information or whether the query was raised by, your, by the auditors, and they obviously were concerned, you still don't appear to have been, have the same concern, even after the explanation from the then Director General? Look, the, the explanation that was given to me, again, it wasn't a detailed explanation. I relayed that back to Deloitte, and then it was in their hands to move with it. And things moved very quickly after that. It wasn't as though... And did they, raise, did they raise queries in respect of any other item on the accounts at the time? On the accounts in general? Yes. No, no. So this was the only issue? This is the only issue they raised. And therefore, yeah. wasn't it an obligation on you to make sure that the issue that raised was fully investigated? It was, and that's what happened, because when I spoke to Deloitte's and gave them the explanation, between myself and Deloitte's, we concluded this wasn't a very detailed explanation, and I suggested that they should speak directly to the Director General, which they then did. OK. Can I go on to the barter account? And, you know, we're talking about €115,680 being paid each year. Uh, which is an extra €40,280. Is that technically what we're talking about as a handling fee for the 75000 or can we get a better explanation of what's being furnished to us? It's effectively, uh, as you said, a handling fee for the... the so, in other words, uh, I'm in a legal practice, someone comes in to me with a cheque for 75000 and saying they don't want to send it on, but would I put it through my account and I'll give you €40,280 for doing that? No, it, it's a fee to the barter company. They're, but they're it's 40,380 for handling a cheque of 75,000. Well, it's not for handling a cheque. I mean, they, they receive but goods and services, and then they have to find. But it's technically to sell on this example, in this so case, it's, it's, it's in this case, it was 75,000, which was forwarded on to the agent for Brian Tuberty, and there was a charge of 40,380 euros. Their fee was 35%. 35%. Yes. 
Uh, is there any other organisation in the country charging a handling fee of 35 per cent? I've never heard of any other company charging a fee of 35 per cent for a one payment and 35 per cent each time. Would you not accept that, you know, should you have raised queries in relation to that barter account? Look, the, the, the barter account, I suppose, you know, I'll go back. I brought the barter account into the accounts, okay? So everything was transparent there at the end of the year. No. In hindsight, yes, I should have gone a step forward, further in early 2020. I should have just shut it down or brought it totally under finances control. And is it, under financial, stage, is it, it under financial control now? Is it under financial control it's now? under total financial control now. So every item that goes through it can be clearly identified and as a result, then, you know, there's full accountability. Every item that goes, will go through it, if ever, any items go through it before, will be budgeted. They'll be okay. budgeted first, and they go through the internal In the last 10 system. years, how much money has gone through the barter account? Um, I'll tell you now, I'll do my maths on it, but I would say there's probably about... It's probably over a million, between a million and a million and a quarter. In 10 years? In 10 years. And why use why not use a normal payment system rather than going through the barter account in this particular case? Why all the secrecy on it? Well, I'm not here to justify the barter account. I wasn't happy with the barter account when I saw it first. Um, you know, I can't speculate on why it was used. Um, it looked like it was where expenses came up relating to the commercial division that hadn't been budgeted for. It, okay. was, it was a way of absorbing those expenses without causing an overrun in the okay. account. And can I just ask you, just in talking about the commercial sector, as regards raising of credit notes, who has the authority to raise a credit note? Well, the, the, the divisional directors can raise credit notes. So any divisional director can raise a credit note. Do they have to consult with the finance department? They would speak to, they would instruct the finance department. Or would they set out a detail as regards why a credit note is being issued? They, I, I don't, if you're asking is there a form that's filled in, no, there isn't a form that's there filled isn't, in. I mean, we're talking about a credit note here of 75,000. Surely there must be a, a system in place. If I'm giving a credit note to someone for 75,000, surely you as financial controller should understand what that credit note is for. Well, the... the, the Any other organisation in the country, 75,000, no problem, just sign on the dotted line, we'll give you a credit note. The credit note would, was approved by the Director General, and from a control point of view, I was happy that it was, you know, from a control point of view, that the Director General had signed it off, that gave me comfort. Thank you. No. <coughs> Right. Thanks, Chair. Deputy Devlin. Uh, welcome to the witnesses again uh, to Leinster House today. Um, and at the outset, can I just say, in terms of the opening statements, I welcome the change in tone uh, from, uh, from RTE today and the emphasis, obviously, on the deceptive nature of the transaction. Um, and I hope, obviously, it's, it's uh, a company with greater transparency, not only here today, but indeed in the next forthcoming uh, few weeks and months. Um, but the impact, and we've seen this ourselves in terms of the journalists and other staff members who've been out protesting and highlighting their concerns, the morale is through the floor in RTE. And for me, with all the staff and indeed the taxpaying public, uh, the trust as well has been eroded. And when I look at the mission statement of RTE, and it says to enrich, which may be a poor choice of words given the discussion today, the life... The Irish life with content challenges, education and entertains. Uh, I suggest that we also look at that mission statement as well uh, in the next little while. But I can also say that it's unsatisfactory uh, that the Director General, um, whatever her status, because yesterday at the media committee there was uncertainty about contracts. And as I look at all of you here, I wonder, are all of your contracts in order? Because there was real head scratching as to who had a contract, what was in order and what wasn't. But it's unsatisfactory that we have an acting interim director general who doesn't have the knowledge that we need. We also have other members who are new who can't give us satisfactory answers. 
But I know that there's an in independent report happening in the next couple of weeks. Hopefully, I think within four weeks it'll be reporting, and uh, hopefully we as a committee uh, can engage with you on that. Um, but can I just start off, uh, Mr Collins, with yourself. Um, how long have you worked with RTE? Joined RTE in January 2020. OK. And up to that point, um, or from that point, should I say, um, have you, when you were concerned, because you said that earlier, you were concerned about the barter account, um, and yet you proceeded with it. Uh, are there any other invoices, accounts that you've made payments to, substantial payments, 75,000, um, that you've had concern about that have been paid out that to this day you're not certain as to what the origin or the necessity for those payments are? No, there's nothing else. And are, are, are you certain, as, this, as the CFO for the organisation, are you certain that there are no other similar payments or payments to contractors, payments to employees, payments to subordinates within RTE or you know, supplying services to RTE? Are there any such similar payments being made or arrangements having been made? Because payments obviously can be made in all sorts of other ways. You can never be 100% certain. You're not 100% you certain. You can never be 100% certain. Okay. All you can say but, is but that given we, the... All I can say, sorry, if I could just answer that, we have very good control systems within RTE. Outside from, of this... From now, or...? Account. Well, we have... If you... As, aside from this barter account, the control oh. systems are generally good in RTE. There's a requisitioning system. There's... But for credit notes... has to be done. There's levels of approval. But for credit notes, it was just signed off, though, right? Which isn't a great system, though, as you can appreciate, right? Yes, yeah. yes. But, I mean, I think the commercial department is a fluid department. Things happen in there. They need to give credits for things. They manage the revenue. But it comes back to part. finance, though, doesn't it? That ultimately, yes. Yeah, OK. Yeah. And can I ask you, then, in terms of uh, the auditors, how long have they served as auditors for the organisation? They, they're... Um, how often have they changed the orders? Every five. Well, they, they were changed in. They took over with the 2018 orders. That's correct. Was, yeah. Uh, so. PPMG part yeah. Okay. And how long had they served? Uh, much longer. I think it was 11 years. And okay. okay. And can I ask, actually, Miss O'Leary, uh, welcome to you as well. Can I ask you then, in terms of the information that we gained yesterday about when people found out about what and when and with who? Um, you're the head of the Audit and Risk Committee, is Correct. that right? Yeah. So, um, and the revelation yesterday was that the information was found on the 16th of March, is that right? Uh, that's correct. And I spoke to the, um, the partner of Deloitte on the 17th. And um, sorry, the, originally he spoke to um, Richard Collins on the 7th and the 9th of March. And I think um, Richard spoke to Dee sometime on, on the 8th. So th he had reported that there was an issue that he was not happy with. And when did it come before then the Audit and Risk Committee? On the, on the 17th of March when he called me. Oh, so you had a meeting on St. Patrick's Day, did you? No, I had a call with them. Um, oh. I, I, I work full time. Ah, I, have okay. to, I have to. I work, I work Saturdays and Sundays to do my RT. I understand. I OK. And so how come it took those three months for the Grant Thornton uh, report to be completed? Well, I, um, I got on to the... The, to, uh, to Grant Thornton on the 21st, on the 23rd. We had a board meeting um, and we, I explained to them the issues that I had, had been highlighted on the 29th. Uh, I got additional information from... That's March, is it? Sorry, yes, 29th yeah. of March. And then I, we started on the terms of reference for both Arthur Cox and for um, Grant Thornton and those were issued to them on the 4th of April. And I was on with them then on a almost weekly basis trying to get um, to see how they were doing. But they had an awful lot of work to do. There was, as they called it, it was their forensic accountant, accounting department and they had a number of emails to go through and uh, mm -hmm. uh, to find out what kind of conversations, etc. people had. So that's why it took the three months. Absolutely. To, and how often had the Audit and Risk Committee been meeting then uh, up to this issue? Um, and the board meeting, we were uh, meeting, um, I'd say, every second week. Ordinarily, every second week? No, we usually meet, meet once a month, but okay. um, because of this... Because we of meeting, this, there was meeting. Yeah. yeah and I understand. Board, yeah. OK, and you were on the board from 2014, is that right? Uh, in, uh, November 20... Uh, OK, and can I ask you then, have you always been the head of the Audit and Risk Committee? Oh, so you got the short straw then. Uh, and then in terms of um, the change in culture... Um, which was referred to in the opening statements. In your time, given the length of period you served uh, on the board, um, have you seen a change in culture in RTE in that period? 
Um, I'm, um, I'm, I'm afraid, um, Deputy, I probably concentrated on the job that I was given by, by Moya, which was to look after audit and risk. Within audit and risk, you've got audit, finance. Oh, I know what's in, they, I know, they I know what's in it. Business continuity plan. Yeah, they didn't no. have a risk register. So I got all of those things in place, including um, strengthening the internal audit, very much so because procurement had some difficulties. Um, you know, uh, even in security had difficulties. Absolutely. And I made sure we made huge so, changes. So, so say from 2014 uh, of your um, time on the board uh, up to, say, 2016, 2017, 2018, was there a change in culture? Because obviously you're having meetings every couple of weeks on the audit committee, uh, were there things that were being flagged more often, more regularly, or had things changed? I thought the internal audit pr procedure had really improved things. We were getting information that we didn't have before. We were able to make changes. Um, Pat Faherty in there is the lead internal auditor, and he is extraordinary. He's really good, and he made sure that new procedures were put in place, people were trained. I thought there was a much better kind of feeling that we're all working together. So this comes as a complete shock to you and... Completely. OK, OK. Um, and thank you for that. Uh, it, so at yesterday's uh, committee meeting on um, media, there was evidence given to the fact that some RT staff have give, uh, were given cars as brand ambassadors. Um, Mr Lynch, can you speak to that? Uh, RT staff have been given cars, yeah. So how, many, how many staff are we talking about? So uh, my understanding is um, I think they are contractors. You think or you know? Um, I know of one. One staff member? Correct. How does a contractor who's not, uh, doesn't have the same terms and conditions get a bonus of a car? That would be a contractor, so um, it would be a contractor who does some work for RTE, um, who then would have a set of other commercial relationships uh, themselves. It's a pretty lucrative contract, wouldn't you think? Absolutely, but yeah. they, they might be doing a, a short-term contract in terms of presenting and so on, but they would also have a set of other things they do for income. And what was the criteria in which a car was given to a contractor? The criteria. So anything like that needs to be approved by the line manager. And who's that? Um, in this case, it would be director of content. Okay, and would they then relate to uh, the director, director General or is there a head of HR? How is that done or is that all done through the DG's office? Um, in terms of that process, I'm not sure what happens after that, whether and, it's just approved locally or not. Okay, and the condition yeah. then for um, a car to be given as part of a contract, uh, is that organised by RTE? It's not, it's, or? No, no, that's not part of it. I'm just saying the RTE contract has nothing to do with the car. That could be uh, uh, presented. Or as a bonus, car. is it? No, the car is nothing. I'm just saying... There are some people who may have an arrangement with the car company, uh, but that has nothing to do with their contract. Okay, okay. Uh, Just to be totally transparent about it. Oh, and that's I also, good. No, I welcome I, that. I, I made inquiries inside, and uh, so I believe okay. there's one person who has been given a car. Who is who's, staff? Who is a staff member in RT. That was disclosed to me last night. Okay, yeah. uh, and I presume that that person is not uh, here today, is that right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, Deputy, just, very briefly, uh, just no, re briefly, sure. Chair, Sorry. thank you. And just can I say, in terms of the risk register and in terms of yeah. what's been said earlier, it's very welcome. Yeah. Um, do you know, or maybe Mr Collins, uh, does RTE routinely pay appearance fees uh, for guests? In terms of guests? Yeah. Uh, yes, they would. And what's the criterion uh, around that? What, what, why so does... typically, actually, let's say a programme like The Late Late Show, they wouldn't pay for guests, actually. And then maybe if you're doing a comedy panel show, they would pay for guests. Okay. And is there control around that then? Yes. And and who who who's in charge of that control? So ensure? basically, in terms of commission programming, there is the IPU. Uh, so within that, there's a finance function who does all the contracting with independent companies who are commissioned to make programming for RTE, and all those fees would be agreed. Okay. Thank so you. There's a, fee, there's a fees committee that would look at all the fees comparatively, look at the hours and the cost. Yeah. Okay, thank you. John Brady. Uh, thanks for um, in the opening statement from the, the chair of the RTE board, uh, Ms. Uh, Radley, you, you state that it appears to you that uh, this was an act designed uh, to deceive. And I think that is the, the, the core point. Can I ask, is, is that view uh, shared by the entire, entire board? Yes. It is. And is that view shared by the executive? 
Uh, uh, well, certainly in the evidence I've seen, yes, the payments were concealed to Ryan Tuberty, yes. So that view is, is shared yes. um, by uh, the executive also. Um, and I suppose that the, the crux of it here is um, who set out to uh, deceive, whether it was an individual, as some would like to portray, or whether it was a, a number of people uh, that came together uh, to uh, deceive. Um, and I'm not sure we get to the bottom of that here at this meeting, but I think that is the, the, the crux of uh, the question. Uh, to go back to a, a, a point um, that uh, was raised early on, just in terms of the Director of Finance, and he was asked as to when he was first uh, approached by uh, Delight, um, the 7th of, of March, am I right in, in, in saying that? Um, at that stage, um, they expressed concern about uh, two of the invoices, two of the payments, 75,000 each, I'm correct in saying that. Um, and you approached uh, the D Forbes at, at, at that point, um, and you set out um, a narrative um, in which uh, D Forbes um, stated that uh, these consultancy invoices uh, were for NK itself, um, and they related to how RTE uh, structured, restructured itself uh, during COVID. I'm, I'm, I'm right in saying that. Broadly, yeah. Now, okay. I can't remember the exact detail, but broadly, okay. that's what it was. Um, was, was that in, in, in writing, or was that...? No, verbally, and I communicated verbally. with Deloitte pretty much immediately afterwards. Okay, verbally. okay. And at that point, you already uh, expressed that um, you didn't have any concerns uh, 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 around um, Noel Kelly, uh, given this type of, of consultancy uh, work um, of, of, of that nature. You, that didn't set off any alarm bells or raise any flags of, of concern within yourself, for yourself? Well, I mean, it, 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 at that stage, the expenditure had been committed. So I was relaying back what happened at that stage. This was, I was, the purpose of speaking to the Director General was to find out what the background was to this um, the payments were to a company controlled by Noel okay, Kelly. But it, so, it, you know, it was it's, obvious it's your, that they went it's, to Noel it's, Kelly. It's your so. role as, as Chief Finance Officer, and if you don't mind, uh, yeah. for, for, for the record, how much are you paid as, as Chief Finance Officer? <laughs> I think that's a private matter. You know, I think we're going to disclose our, 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 we're going to disclose our earnings. We've been sorry, asked to Sorry, just, sorry, just want to intervene here for a minute. The Chair of the Board said that all of those figures are going to be published. And given the fact that you're, you know, that you're in the, you're working for a public organisation, I would expect to hear that answer here today. The deputy has asked you, how much is your salary? I expect you to, I would expect you to answer that question. I don't know what my exact salary is off the top of my head. But, don't but I can give you, I, no, sorry, I can give you. It's absolutely sorry, outrageous. Give you an ex Chief yeah. Financial Officer of RT can't tell us what he's paid. Am I supposed officer. to buy that? Chief Financial Officer, just Chief Financial Officer, being asked a question by the deputy who has the floor. Deputy Brady has the floor. Well, what's, it's, it's, what's your salary? This is a, a extraordinary. Now it's taken oh, 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 well, over like. a minute now to get a, yeah. a very basic answer. I, I, I would have imagined. We have, we have public bodies in here every week who, uh, you know, senior staff. We we can get the uh, figures for their salaries. You know, any problem? RT is you know transparency. Truth, trans well, I have no trust. problem being transparent. Truth, with you, transparent, and trust. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's a very basic question, and I expect the answer to it for the members. Okay, I, I believe my salary is around two hundred thousand base salary, plus a car allowance of twenty-five thousand. Right. Um, okay. But it's in and around that sort of thing. Okay, so yeah. 200,000 plus a, a car, car allowance. So, okay, yeah. um, thank you for that. And look, he's after. Winding down a lot of my time, Chair, I hope uh, that, that that's noted as well. So um, you're paid an extraordinary amount of money. So essentially what you became uh, was a, a message boy for uh, D Forbes, the Director General, as opposed to doing your specific role. You took a, a message directly from uh, the Director General, didn't question it, and, and brought that back uh, to uh, Deloitte. Is that what you're Well, I was asked to get an explanation. What, what more could I have done at that stage? I was asked to get an explanation of what a more detailed explanation of what Is it not your role to discover to? untruths and, you know, uh, proper answers, truthful answers um, yeah, in I think, relation uh, look, to all financial matters? I think if the issue had come on my radar earlier 
Absolutely, yes. Okay. Well, that's okay. when it came on my radar, and Deloitte were looking for an answer quickly on that. Okay. Because we had an audit so, just, just, just in relation to that um, meeting on, 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 on the 7th of March, you went back to uh, Deloitte. Deloitte then uh, went to uh, the Director General at that point. Okay. So we understand. Um, it's, uh, your, 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 your understanding, and they were unhappy with the uh, response that was uh, given at, at, at that point. Yesterday, I, I, I think Adrian Lynch stated that um, when he was asked a specific question in relation to Ryan Tuberty and his announcement on the uh, 16th of, of March that he was stepping down from his role um, in uh, presenting the, the Late Late Show, and you said there was absolutely no way he would have known that this was going on in the background when that decision was uh, taken. Do you stand over that, those comments? Uh, no, I actually don't have to yesterday because, um, just to give context, um, because I knew it would come up, so what I'd actually done was I, had, I was trying to work out the day the director of content told me that Ryan Tuberty had come into his office to tell him that he was stepping down. So I went back and checked my email because I had sent him an email with a list of potential presenters. Uh, and that was on, um, I think it was March 13th. So I, I, in my mind, I didn't realize that actually the CFO had had contact from the auditors on whatever it was, March the 10th or whatever. So just to clarify that. Okay, so Ryan Tuberty could well have been um, informed by somebody that this process um, had, or these concerns had been raised. Based, uh, have, yep. based on the information from okay. yesterday, did, it's, it's, it's possible. Okay. Can yeah, I ask, uh, Mr. Yeah. Collins, did you have any conversations with um, um, Noel Kelly or, or Mr. Tuberty in relation to this process? No Is anyone aware of any conversations or discussions that the Director General may have had with uh, the agent representing Mr. Tuberty or Mr. Tuberty himself? The only conversations I was aware of was between the Director of Content and Ryan Tuberty. Okay, so it would be reasonable to say that um, this process, the uncovering of uh, these payments, could well have influenced Ryan Tuberty's decision to step down from his, his role as presenting the, the Late Late Show. Yeah, and I'd say it's possible if possible. you look at the information. Yeah. Okay, just in, 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 in relation to um, the, um, the tripartite um, agreement, the deal, um, and the uh, payments. I, I want to focus on, on, on year one. Um, and we, we, we know that uh, Ms O'Leary, um, you've already stated that you negotiated um, that you were, you were responsible for that part. Um, uh, yes, I was asked to represent that uh, proposal to Renault in early 20, in March 2020, yes. Okay, okay. Um, and in, 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 in relation to uh, the credit note um, that, that was um, issued uh, by uh, Renault, um, to who, 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 who to, was that issued? Renault. Yeah, so my initial meeting with the client was on or the 9th. To Renault. Of, uh, to, with yep. Renault, sorry, it was on the 9th of March. Um, the client said he would, cons he would consider it. Uh, he'd run through his finance department. The week afterwards, COVID broke out. So um, obviously it wasn't a priority for him. So by the time we actually reconnected on it and got to see how we could work through it, it was July 2020. Okay, okay. And had they sought that uh, credit note? Um, they, he was very, the client was very clear from the beginning that it would have to be cost neutral, that he did not have any incremental money. By the time it came to July, um, uh, when we were raising the credit note, um, a large part of the value of what Renault would, should have got through their late, late um, sponsorship hadn't happened because a, a key part of their broadcast sponsorship, which is the three-year contract, which I was referring to earlier, includes 20 tickets per week okay. on hospitality at RTE. Okay. So and that value did not happen from the 20th of March through to September because of okay. COVID and no audience. And that, uh, the, the, the credit note, the request for the credit note then, that went to, where, where did that go from I there? I sent then? the request for the credit note to my finance manager in for, commercial for, and the CFO. And the C C CFO, okay. So, Mr. Collins, you would have got sight of, of, of that uh, request at that stage? Okay, and what was the nature of the request? What was explicitly stated on it um, that the credit note was for? The credit note was for um, a, a credit note to, to Renault in relation to the sponsorship. Now, I wasn't in this tripartite or commercial agreement, I wasn't aware of the the terms of that, I wasn't involved in negotiating that. So, you know, 
to be honest, I didn't cop what this was relating to. Didn't cop? Did yeah. you ask? Well, I didn't ask because I wasn't aware of the terms of the, okay, the Renault so relationship. You, you, or the you were asked to sign off on a, a huge... Well, I wasn't asked, no, I wasn't asked to sign off on it. The, it was, again, it was processed and I was, I was copied on an email then. Well, that copied on an processed. email. So, yeah, so I was aware that... You asleep at the wheel? No, I wasn't. I was aware... Well, it appears you were asleep no, at the wheel on, the, on the, several fronts, no, sir. The Director General was involved in this. I took comfort from a control point of view that the Director General was looking at this. Now, at the time, you've got to remember at the time, I was dealing with a number of major issues in the organisation. It was the start of COVID, or early on in COVID. It looked like RTE could run out of cash. We had an accounting system implementation that was not going well and could have caused major problems for the business. We had two big tax audits we were under pressure okay. on. And ju so ju 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 course, ju 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 know, just a very so final point, uh, Chair, ju overnight. just a very just final a, point. So um, it is very clear then that from year one of the contract, not when we're told it was only year two and three that the guarantee kicked in. Year one, RTE were actually uh, paying the 75,000. So RTE were, were propping up. So essentially the guarantee was there from, from year one. Contrary to what has been stated by, by Miss O'Leary that she wasn't aware of any guarantee to underpin. I wasn't, I repeat that I wasn't aware that it was underwritten because I, I didn't have sight of, the, of Ryan Tuggery's contract. Thank you. Moving on, I'm going to suspend the meeting for five minutes uh, and return then and continue the question. And the next speaker for the, for the members is uh, Deputy Verona Murphy.
resume in public session and the next committee member to come in is Deputy Verona Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for your appearance. But at a time when we have the greatest housing catastrophe in the history of our state, and we have overspending in our Department of Health where there are no checks and balances, billions have been wasted annually. We have government that displays complete incompetence with the management of the public finances. And this story comes out of a clear blue sky, manna from heaven, to distract from the issues that really impact ordinary daily lives. The government are delighted with the story because it's taken the spotlight from them on a run up to Dáil recess. And I've watched the rolling media brawl for the last week or nearly week and a half. And I must admit, I have some experience in media brawl it's clear that this media circus can be reduced to the following facts. Certain people within RTE conceived a scheme of deceit for a number of reasons. One, to retain the services of Ryan Tuberty, and two, to portray to the general public and to the staff of RTE that Tuberty had, to take a pay, had taken a pay cut. The public, certain staff at RTE, and this committee were lied to. No checks and balances in any systems of checks and balances will prevent deceit. And that's just a fact of life. With a large organisation such as RTE, people run for cover and they immediately look for scapegoat or scapegoats, as may be the case. And in what would appear to me generally is the case, those who identified the scapegoats were themselves the cause of the controversy quite often. The act of deceit is only surpassed by the more despicable act of scapegoating. Never have I seen more obvious scapegoating than in this debacle. And RTE conceived the scheme of the, de of the deceit and induced Ryan Tuberty, whom I don't know personally, nor do I know his family, nor any of the other people that have been men mentioned in relation to Ryan Tuberty. But he was induced with the pay package to stay. And a number of members have confirmed this week that there was no wrongdoing on Ryan Tuberty's behalf. And the people in front of us effectively dismissed D Forbes, and then issued a lengthy press release scapegoating her. The quality of management should be judged by the way they deal with the situations they find themselves in. And I can assure you, what I have heard today and yesterday and for the last week would indicate to me that this management does not have the skill set to deal with what's before them other than they've, all they have done is look for scapegoats. And whilst RTE say Ryan Tuberty did nothing wrong, your actions do not support that position. Tuberty no longer presents his programme. And in my view, the act of taking Ryan Tuberty off air was wrong, and it has compounded the controversy, whilst at the same time, destroying Mr. Tuberty's reputation in the scapegoating. And it was ill-advised and one that should have only been done with the approval of the board. It's as plain as a pike staff to any person with a modicum of common sense that this act will cost RTE and, of course, the taxpayer far more in compensation to Tuberty than the 150,000 that we're talking about that was legally due anyway. So the bill for the action will have to be delivered at some point in the future. And I have one question with regard this, I suppose, delegation. Who made the decision to take Ryan Tuberty 
off air, bearing in mind your, con your continuous state or statements that he did nothing wrong. Now, and I am assuming that one of two people can answer that question because it certainly wasn't anyone that isn't here. So, ultimately, because I'm the interim Deputy Director General, that is my decision as editor in chief. So, why is it off air? Is because RT is an obligation to be independent. And I'm impartial. sorry, I can't hear Mr. Lynch. Can you not? For some reason. No. Oh. How's that? Is that? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. The, um, so, as uh, Deputy Director General, um, it is my decision to take Ryan Tuberty off air in consultation with the Director of Content. Um, and the director of content is not here. Correct. Was that decision put before the board? No. Are you, are you telling me now, Mr. Lynch, that in your capacity with someone who isn't here, the director yeah. of content, you have ex you made a decision, in effect, which has, has exposed hundreds of thousands, if not millions, in compensation have exposed RTE and, in effect, the taxpayer. That's the decision made by you. I'm, I'm the editor-in-chief, yes. So you made that decision. And what, what was your rationale? You, you made the statement also that he has done nothing wrong. So, the, as I understand it from legal Do advice... You, are you no. saying now he did something wrong? No. So you, you continue with the statement that Ryan Tuberty has done nothing wrong? I, I, it's not wrong, he has done nothing illegal. The contract that Ryan Tuberty uh, engaged with is illegal. Is, the, there, a, is there a difference? You're, there, you're, there is a you're difference. You're asserting a difference. There is a difference between the, edi the editorial... Do you, think, do you think when it comes to compensation there will be a difference? Because they'll only be interested in the legal element. So we are back with the question I put to you. Will you resign over the compensation that will be paid to Ryan Tuberty? So, as I said in my opening That's statement... That's a binary question. Yes yeah. or no would be the answer. Will you resign and make yourself accountable for a decision that you can be sure has ruined Ryan Tuberty? He's taken off the air under the assertion by RTE that he has done nothing wrong. You didn't say he didn't do anything illegal. You said he had done nothing wrong. And I'm sure that that will be brought up a number of times to you. Will you resign, yes or no? That will be a matter for the incoming Director General. So you, with the, just one other, I just go to Miss O'Reilly here. Are you happy that you have been exposed now as the chair of RTE to compensation without a shadow of a doubt. We're all of a frame of mind here commercially that we know the realm of these types of things will run into hundreds of thousands, if not millions, because we, he's not the only person that has been mentioned. And it has been the assertion of RTE from both yourself and Mr Lynch that he did nothing wrong. But yet, we're faced with a big bill. How do you feel about that decision being made, of which you seemingly had no act or part? So just to clarify... No, no. no do you, do I'm you, sorry, this, is, this pertains to your question. It is not the role of the board to get involved in editorial decision-making. Excuse me, the role of one the second. In chief. Editorial decision-making. Who, so who's the editorial decision made by? Are we back to Mr. Lynch? The Editor-in-Chief. Which is? Mr. Mr. Lynch. Lynch at this point in time. So really, all of the bluster that you've come in here with about what you're going to do, it's only bluster, isn't it? Because you've exposed RTE among you with a massive bill for compensation to someone that you assert as having done nothing wrong. And yet you've not just thrown them all under the bus, you've backed over them and reversed at speed. So can you tell me, Mr Lynch, are you going to be accountable in the future for when the compensation is paid? Because if he did nothing wrong, what was the basis and the rationale for taking him off the air? 
and paying him while he's off the air and paying a, another presenter to do his radio programme. Are you going to be accountable? Yeah, I'll be completely accountable. So you it. will resign. You're going to confirm then today that you will resign when that happens because as sure as light follows day, that's going to happen. No, I'm just saying I'm taking full responsibility for the decision for Ryan Tuberty not to be an heir. So, you, sorry, Chair, we need to clarify for that. So, you are are you saying you will resign, Mr. Lynch, and be no. accountable uh, for that decision? No. No, oh, thank you. Well, then talk is cheap. Deputy Allen Dillon. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. And uh, look, we accept your your appearance here before us again today and appreciate your cooperation. <laughs> Back in September 2020, uh, RTE campaigned on truth matters. And I have to assume today, all of you in front of us in the Public Accounts Committee are here to tell the truth. But I still can't find where the truth is or how we can determine what the real sequence of events occurred. And certainly that reminds me of a famous line from Theodore Roosevelt in 1912, who, who said, looking for the truth is like nailing jelly to the wall. So from yesterday's committee meeting, and again, we're in public session for the last nearly two hours, there is still a lot of facts that are still unknown. And we want even further detail in relation to the sequence of events. So can I ask uh, the CFO, Richard Collins, in relation to your payment to Noel Kelly for services provided during COVID, these were really payments for Ryan Tuberty and Reynold. Is that correct? Yes or no? According to the Grant Thornton report, yes. They had nothing to do with Renault. Sorry, Ms. O'Leary, my questions are directed to the CFO. You said earlier you needed to consult your notes. Can I ask what is contained within your notes that would that would have led you to previously state in that? Sorry, I didn't get your question there. You said previously that you needed to consult your notes in relation to the questions that we asked previously. No, in relation to the explanation I gave yes. to Deloitte's. Can I also ask, do you know where, um, do you, would you determine these types of payments uh, in a serious manner in relation to their intent? As Deputy Burke discussed around consultancy fees and the obligations around VAT uh, exemptions that were put through a barter. Well, we weren't paying. We, RTE wasn't making the payment there, so VAT wasn't an issue for RTE. It was the barter company. The, the invoice was to the barter company, not to RTE. The chair of the board yeah. outlined in their initial statement that there was deceitful practices in play here. Yeah. Would you agree with that? I would. Yes. Um, would prime time investigates call it fraud? Would you agree? Well, I think we've had legal advice to say that it isn't fraud. In what context? Well, I think it's, it's been looked at as, as part of the Grand Thornton Review. Arthur Cox have looked at this and they've given advice or given an opinion and there is not fraud involved here. But raising, raising invoices for something knowing that it's not what it is? Well, it's concealment and deception. And would you not determine that to be fraud, wrongfully known? It depends who the fraud is against, if anyone has lost out. I mean, you could say the, the tax, in my own opinion, is maybe the taxpayer was, was defrauded, but... Um... Can I ask, what other external contractors um, did you pay for advice during COVID? Off the top of my head, I'm, I'm not aware of any other contractors that were paid for advice. 
I mean, there would have been on the IT side, we would have had, we would have taken advice on setting up, you know, structuring ourselves to work remotely and that. But would you have issued any credit notes during COVID? Similar to the, not similar to this, no. So this is a once-off. Well, it looks like it. Yes, yeah. Can I ask Miss O'Leary in relation to um, were you consulted around March seventh? Uh, or before March 17th about the Deloitte query? No one, no one communicated to you that there was, that these issues were being flagged? No, I was advised by the head of legal and the head of HR that I was going to be contacted by Grant Thorn Thornton to engage in a process. Why, why didn't the CFO, Richard, why, why didn't you raise that with the person who was in a position to authorise these invoices? Raise which? Well, sorry, is that a question to me? Well, I had raised the issue with the um, person who had approved the invoices, and Deloitte were then put in contact with them to get an explanation. Can I ask, did, did RT, can I ask Ms. O'Leary, did RTE pay for the three Renault events, and how much did that cost? Um, yes, if, if, if I could clarify before I say that, and I will go straight back to it, is that it's very important to say that Renault were not involved in year two and three. So when you refer to the invoices that, that went through the barter company, they had no connection with Renault. So I just want to be very clear about that. Um, year one, yes, the 70, um, Renault paid um, Noel Kelly management for the three events, but ultimately they had got a credit note. So it was cost neutral to them. And how much, how much was the credit note? 75,000. And how much were the events that subsequently uh, 40 paid for? 25,000 each for the appearances. And how much to actually host the event? The uh, host of the event was um, 30,586. Uh, and are these events accounted for in RTE's audited, uh, annual audited accounts? They, the transactions are certainly record, recorded in the Barter account, which is now... Yeah, they are finance, recorded, so yes. yes, I can clarify that. In 2022? Yes. Okay, can I ask just in relation to other events that RTE would host, be it hospitality or events, mm -hmm. through the Barter account? Uh, can you give us uh, some events, recent events, that you would have paid for through a Barter account uh, yes, and I the can. types of events that you would... Um, um. So, for example, there was uh, an agency event um, in a in a venue in town. Um, in Dublin. In Dublin, sorry, apologies. 